program support for Ask a Question, Save a Life comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act. This program is made possible in part by the Kim Foundation, reminding viewers there is help, there is hope, and there is healing for lives touched by mental illness. Learn more at thekimfoundation.org. Program support comes from Bryan Mental Health Services, offering hope and treatment for patients with mental health issues and their families. More information can be found at bryanhealth.org or by calling 402-481-5991. What is depression? Where do I get help? Do you know the warning signs? What should I do? It's okay to talk about suicide. Suicide of our military service members is at an all-time high. It is now surpassing the rate of the general population. Females attempt suicide three times more than males. Most individuals who are suicidal often display cues or warning signs. Older adults have a rate of suicide 50% higher than that of all other ages. Ask a question, save a life. Ask a question, save a life. Ask a question, save a life. Hello, I'm Dr. David Myers. Ryan Medical Center Mental Health Services Manager and Co-Chair of the Nebraska State Suicide Prevention Coalition. Suicide is a public health problem that impacts all ages. Suicide is preventable and becoming more educated about suicide prevention, the more lives we can save. There's a myth that says if we talk about suicide, it will give somebody the idea. This is indeed a myth. The best thing we can do is to talk about it. By raising the question of suicide without showing shock or disapproval, shows the person you are taking them seriously and are responding to their pain. Today's program is going to focus on suicide prevention in the youth, the military, and the elder adult populations. My name is Madeline and I thought about suicide. I had a plan to kill myself. Hi, I'm Jennifer. And I'm Ford. And I have a daughter that wanted to die. Before Madeline came to us, I had absolutely no idea that she was having uh, suicidal thoughts or she was hurting herself in any way. We more just kind of discovered by accident that she was, that she was cutting. And we're, we were terrified. We have lost a child to suicide. Ryan was bullied a lot um, during his sixth grade year. He loved cars. Every time we would drive or go somewhere, he loved pointing out different cars. He was actually holding his little sister and smiling, all, all happy. The time that this happened, he told his mom he was going to go outside and play, or he was going to go look for a friend, but the friend ended up not being there. And so, I remember driving up, and when he, when Ryan had hung himself, he hung, he he had hung himself from a tree on a main street. It was a heartbreaking moment. I'm Nikki and I lost a friend to suicide. And We had science together. He um, had told me the night before that, you know, he was contemplating, you know, that he was going to commit suicide. He's like, hey, you want to know something? And I was like, yeah, sure. So he's like, well, I think I'm, I'm going to do it tonight. And I was kind of, it took me back, but you know, um, there's, at that age, I feel like a lot of kids kind of contemplate it. Um, so it was something that I had heard a lot from other students, so I didn't take it 
seriously in the sense like I almost felt responsible because I didn't tell somebody about it. Um, so it's a guilt that like I kind of still carry with me today too because it was like if I told somebody maybe I could have prevented it. There are definitely signs that things were that things were going in a negative direction with Madeline. Um, she was more moody, and um, you can you can pass that off as a teenager. But my mood swings started to get a little more drastic, and I started closing myself off and spending a lot of time by myself. She wasn't sleeping well. Again, teenagers have different irregular sleeping patterns, um, but all of those things combined. Um, and her, her personality just, her personality changed. She wasn't this bright, cheery person anymore. Um, she was rarely happy. I would come to school some days and just be in the worst mood, didn't want to talk to anybody. And everyone would come up, are you okay? And I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'm fine, just go away. And I guess kind of through all this, I've found that a lot more people than I thought are a lot like me. People that don't have a mental illness have no clue what it's like to have that inside of your head. And they think that it's not crazy, it's not anything, it's something that happens. It's just a part of life for some people. And I, and I told Madeline, you're not crazy, you don't belong in an asylum, you need help. We all need help. Uh, if I broke a bone in my arm, I would go to the hospital. If there's something broke in my brain, I go to the hospital to, to try to, to get that help. For someone who has a friend that's suicidal, I would say if you see a warning sign or if they you know, openly just come out and say it, don't take it lightly, it's not a joke. Um, even if they have a little short laughter at the end of it, it's a serious matter and you don't want to hold that guilt um, inside of you. So I would go to the nearest adult or talk to a teacher, talk to the counselor, talk to your parents, talk to somebody to let them know that let them know what's going on so that way um, it can get into the right person's hands who can help this help your friend out because you don't want to lose them. If, if Madeline had gone to a friend and said please don't tell my parents please don't tell my uh, please don't tell anyone about this again I would rather have my best friend really upset with me and alive than dead. Don't keep secrets, especially when you know your friend tells you, gives you a cue that they could possibly be thinking about suicide and you know they give you that don't tell, don't tell anybody. They might be angry at you for the time being once they find out that you told somebody but you know when they are living their life later on they're gonna thank you and they're gonna you know the anger will stop, the anger will end. Once they get help they'll realize that they're lucky to have a friend like you. If you're concerned about your friend, if you're afraid that they're going to do something that could seriously harm them or whatever, is you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to be their friend and lose them or for them to hate you but they're still alive? Don't hesitate. Take it seriously until you find out it's not serious, but it is something that definitely you need to pay attention to and follow through with. parents ask a question, save a life. You don't be afraid to ask your children if they're contemplating suicide because you can save their life for it. Talk to your kids and I mean I know a lot of parents say oh I talk to my kids all the time and all they tell me is oh school was fine. Dig a little deeper. If you want to know what's going on in their life you have to dig deeper. And there are so many parents that are afraid to talk to their children and we hear the PSAs on the radio and on television. You have to talk to your kids. You have to learn how to talk to your kids. I hope that people aren't desensitized with that. And they have to talk to their children about important things. It's not, how was your day? What'd you do? It's, how'd you feel? How do you feel today? What's wrong? Is there anything I can do to help? You have to communicate it was a lot of 
talking with my parents and they were the reason that I told them I was having these thoughts and I had this plan because I told them there was that 1% of me that could not do that to them. I could not hurt them like that. That made me tell them, okay, I need some serious help. Just talk to your kids and it's important to, you know, be there for them and you know you need to be a parent but it's also important especially during teenage years to be a friend as well and somebody that they can confide in and somebody that they can come to with anything and you know don't put up a wall where they don't feel like they can't talk to you about anything and everything and just ultimately be there for them. don't hold it all in. That only makes it worse. I thought, you know, this is my problem. I can handle this myself. And that's not the case. It's so much easier to handle when you tell people about it and ask for help. You don't have to go through it alone. It, it, you just don't. There are so many people out there that care about you, that can help that walling yourself away, shutting yourself in your room, shutting yourself off from everyone, it's just gonna make things worse. Ask your family member if they're thinking about suicide. You're not going to give someone an idea simply by asking them. And you could save their life. And don't be afraid to ask a second time or a third time um, and be prepared to hear the answer. If you're thinking about suicide, my message would be that, you know, think about your loved ones and think about how this is going to hurt and affect your family and your friends and that ultimately, you know, you're leaving Every, everybody with like a burden on them realize you know thinking what could I have done differently what could what did they feel like you know they're responsible for something because they didn't catch any cues because there are so many and it's just it's not fair to anybody else and it's not fair to yourself because you have so much more to do and you have so much more to show the world and you're just cutting everything short for every every person that's feeling hurt or um, bullied or or thinking about suicide there are so many people around you that love you and that will be willing to if they just knew that you're thinking about suicide there are so many people that are around you that show you love and are interested in you and you're not alone a lot of people have committed suicide Please don't do it. it. It hurts the family. It hurts the community. It, it's hard. It, it will put other people in pain. I understand that someone would not think about suicide as an answer to their problem, that suicide often is just a way that people want to end the hurt. People who think about suicide are often just in so much pain that it's the way that they're trying to end the pain that they're in. And what I would say is that there are other ways that we can try and help you end your pain. It feels like you're at the bottom of an empty well and all you can see is a little light when you look up. But you can reach, I mean, you can get there. It, it, you don't have to do it alone, no matter what, no matter how alone they feel. They're not alone. As you have seen, suicide is one of the most sudden and traumatic events that can impact families. Adolescents today are faced with extreme stress, confusion, self-doubt, and the pressures to succeed. The adolescent suicide rate has increased 200% in the last 50 years in the age group of 15 to 24. If you're concerned about an adolescent who may be suicidal, ask the question, are you thinking about suicide? Be a good listener. Offer reassurance and support. 
there are resources that can help you provide the connectedness to professionals who can help. The next group we're going to focus on is our military personnel, where their suicide rate has increased dramatically since the start of the global war on terrorism. My name is Scott Ehler. I'm the full-time state support chaplain for the Nebraska Military Department. And my job in Nebraska is a resource for people that are in need. I am Roma Amundsen, Brigadier General, retired United States Army. I am Sergeant First Class Wilson, and I've had thoughts of suicide. I am Viola Rashke. I'm the Director of Psychological Health for the Nebraska National Guard. Upon returning to the U.S., things were different. I was different. I felt out of place and angry all the time over little things. Well, since I have young children, it was hard for me to put on my mommy face and be the perfect mother when all I was thinking about was my time in theater. My husband and I started fighting daily about my drinking at night and my depression that seemed to consume me. I went to see my doctor and he put me on a medication, but I couldn't stop drinking and my depression just seemed to get worse with time. I think military members are more susceptible to suicide with basically what, what everybody else is susceptible to suicide with. Um, the factors that we see are mostly financial and relationship factors. In a six year period of time, for an active duty family, there are more stressors placed upon a military family than in 80 years of a regular family. So indeed, you know, there are more stressors, but on the other, ha on the other hand, the military has been reacting um, to counteract some of those stressors. They become more aware of it, and um, so I think that um, that's helpful. When I was going through reintegration, I bought a motorcycle, and I began to drink heavily due to being alone at night. I didn't want to go back to that dark place. The biggest thing that family and friends need to look for is when we see these stressors like financial and relationship, when they start to pile up on each other, because I think those are probably the two biggest foundational issues. And then we start adding in, in different things like alcohol abuse, substance abuse, um, we see depression. These are the things I think fan the flames. Um, so I think families and friends, when they look toward to that, uh, when they see stuff just start piling, all these different stresses piling on top of each other and a person doesn't know where to turn, doesn't see any hope, um, once that, those things start to pop up in people's lives, that's, that's when we need to really stand up and take notice. My family didn't understand what I went through and I couldn't tell them. Well, my family was exactly the way I left them, but I was different. They expected me to just jump back into this mothering role when after a year or so, that part of me had just been turned off. It was hard for me to adjust back into carpooling and soccer games when all I really wanted was to be back in Iraq. Things that family members and um, friends should look for, for in terms of identifying stressors, it could be the increased use of alcohol and drugs. Uh, it could be withdrawal from normal activities. Uh, it could be just simply staying by themselves, withdrawal from all activities whatsoever. Uh, it could be sudden changes in um, demeanor, you know, uh, depression. Uh, these would be some of the things I think that you could probably identify. Family members and friends are the first people, that they're going to spend the most time with, with individuals and they're the first ones that are going to see some very minute change in behaviors. Uh, there seems to be a thing within our society that people don't want to ask you know, have you thought about suicide? Have you thought about hurting yourself? Because there's, a, there's an idea that if I ask, suddenly that becomes an option or that becomes an idea, which is completely not true.
there's a lot of resources that are out there. I think uh, the, probably the easiest to turn to are, are the chaplains and the director of psychological health in the state. Uh, we'll be able to point them in, in the direction that they need to go, give them the help that they need. Um, especially with family members, um, we'll be able to give them, you know, some things to, to some questions to ask their family members. Um, you know, really kind of just look into what's going on in their lives to see if they are at risk. The Nebraska National Guard has what we call a peer-to-peer -peer program. So there's individuals which in each unit that has specialized training in how to help each other with emotional as well as any financial, any stressors that occur, they're specially trained to help with that. So any trusted friend, family, anyone within their unit, the VA, we have chaplains um, throughout the state as well as community clergy. It's not so much where do you go, but go somewhere and, and have the discussion. Reach out and let somebody know. That's probably the biggest stigma in the military is that we penalize people when they, when they seek out help. Um, from the top, to, top down, it's, it's, we encourage people to seek out help because we don't want to lose people. Um, suicide is a very permanent solution to a temporary problem. You know, at having been a senior leader in the military, uh, I can absolutely say without any question that they will not be penalized. The concern of the command is to protect the person and help them help themselves. So to get them into treatment and make sure that they're taking care of themselves to return to, to a level of healthy functioning. For some service members, that can seem at times to be a penalty because it can keep them from deploying, it can keep them from doing some missions that maybe they, they really would like to do, but it's really a protective factor. If you have a broken leg or if you have some sort of an illness, a medical illness, you won't, be, uh, you won't be sent either. If you have dental problems, you won't be sent. And so people need to realize that this is just in a class the same as what an, uh, as another medical problem is. We are interested, at the senior level, we are interested in saving people's lives. We do not want them to commit suicide because that is a permanent, solu permanent solution for a temporary problem. If you are yourself contemplating it as a military member, or if you as a member of a family see an individual who has experienced all those different signs of potential uh, suicide, be sure that you ask the tough question, are you thinking of committing suicide, or of admitting the fact too that I am thinking of committing suicide, and taking yourself off to seek help. I thought about my family and my brothers who are still in the fight in Afghanistan. What good would I be to them if I was dead? It takes a lot of strength to be able to reach out and ask for help. Although a lot of people think it's a weakness, it it's, takes a very strong person to reach out and admit that they can't handle things on their own. If you see someone, and again, you, you, there's just a feeling that there's a change in behavior, start the conversation. I started to open up to my girlfriend my family, tell them about, told them about everything that happened. And I thought they'd be ashamed of me for what I had to do. But instead, they were, they were supportive. They even offered to go to therapy with me. You know your family the best. You know your soldier the best. If you see changes in behavior, if you see the stressors that are starting to stack up, and you see them trying to self-medicate, then, then get them the help that they need. Don't just talk to them about the help, but get them the help that they need. Now I know that I have hope. I look forward to seeing my children grow up, and if need be, going to serve my country again. There are days when I see the dark clouds gathering, but now I know I have support to see me through it. So often when I talk to people who have attempted suicide, the one thing 
that they say over and over is, I really wanted somebody to ask me the question. I wanted somebody to reach out and show that they cared. So we really have to step up to the plate and be that person that asks and be that person that maybe it sounds a little funny and you don't want to embarrass the other person, but I, I think I'd rather ask the question to a friend or a family member and be a little embarrassed when, the, when, they, when they say no than to, to have to live with not asking. I've talked with many people who are survivors of a person who has committed suicide and almost to a person, they always say, if only we could have done something to have stopped that suicide. It is a question that is a tragic question and it haunts an individual. And, I, and again, be sure to always ask the tough question, are you thinking of committing suicide? The transition of our military service members back home to civilian life can be stressful. This stress can lead to mental health concerns. Service members and their families sometimes are reluctant to seek mental health services due to feelings of not wanting to let anyone down, shame, guilt, and stigma. Resources and support do exist for our service members and their families. It's okay to ask for help. The next section is gonna focus on suicide prevention in our elderly American population, which have one of the highest suicide rates of all ages. I'm Pat Talbot and I was very suicidal. I am Jean and I have a sister who has uh, suffered from thoughts of suicide. I'm Dr. Steve Wingle. I'm a psychiatrist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I specialize in treating older adults, people 65 and older, that have a variety of mental illnesses. I was thinking about what difficult years those were and how very, very hard it was and how much I really thought I wanted to die. But she was doing things to herself that would indicate, you know, she, and she would talk about the fact that she really just didn't want to keep living. So life was not good for her. Uh, she did not anticipate that it ever would be. And so there was a lot of despair and depression. So yes, it was, it was quite obvious. Uh, and there was a part of me that's a little bit chicken, so I think that's part of what helped me not to commit suicide or make you know, th those attempts. Um, but I, I'm just so grateful. Today she's a very uh, uh, useful, uh, happy, uh, dynamic person, but there were, it took a long time for her to work through that with the help of a lot of professionals. There is a myth out there that, that um, talks about depression as a normal part of aging, and that is just not accurate. It's, it's, there's nothing about it that's true. Certainly as people age, the average person does think about death. They think about um, what will happen when this physical life on this earth ends. Uh, that's natural. But it's really not natural that people think about committing suicide, about ending their own life. I think it maybe becomes more prevalent uh, as people get older, depending on their circumstances. Uh, older people, they, they lose family or get, get uh, further distance from family. They don't have the close ties and close relationships. They get lonely and so depression, I think, becomes more prevalent. Family members can keep an eye out for changes, uh, especially changes in the way a person functions. So if an older adult used to be very socially active, very energetic, optimistic, and now they're kind of fretting about things that they normally wouldn't fret about. Uh, they feel kind of hopeless. They feel anxious for no apparent reason. Those can be warning signs of depression, and uh, I think those warrant investigation. Depression is a pretty easy thing to spot in people. Uh, because they withdraw, they don't want to talk, they don't, they don't want to have an interest in uh, anything. So it's an e easy thing to spot. Harder thing to confront. I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing to go to somebody that you know or love, a family member or friend, and say, hey, so it looks to me like something's wrong with you, let's talk about it. 
ask the question. I mean, don't be afraid to ask the question, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Uh, because when you ask that point blank uh, of someone, it tends to make it more obvious to be able to answer answer that question and to realize and encourage and say, hey, you know, we couldn't do without you. Don't, don't even think about going there. You know, we can find you the help you need and the support that you need. Asking somebody where your gut is telling you, I'm a little concerned about this person. I'm worried that they might be thinking about suicide. The right thing to do is to ask them, to overcome your own anxiety about it. It's hard. That's a hard question to ask somebody, whether it's a loved one or a friend, but it's the right question to ask them. You'll never really put the idea in their head. You might save somebody's life, on the other hand, if you do ask. This generation, the older generation, is a very proud, very independent group of people. And they have surmounted many, many obstacles, living through the Depression in some cases, living through world wars and so forth. Um, they have learned to be self-reliant, and that's good, but that makes it hard for them to ask for help. And it particularly makes, makes it hard for them to ask for help about things like mental illness. There is still a lot of stigma that society carries against mental illness. And some people, especially older people, might feel that admitting that they feel sad, admitting that they worry a lot, admitting that they feel hopeless, might be a sign of weakness. If I'm around somebody that I see like that, I, it's my obligation to try to talk to them and, and, and get them to communicate a little bit and, and then talk about the fact they don't have to feel this way if they don't want to. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't feel like you're alone. Uh, you know, people do care. You may not think that there's someone, you know, maybe next door if your family's far away or maybe those relationships aren't as close as what they used to be. Uh, but it's a tragedy uh, when anyone commits suicide, whether you're old or young, I mean, any age. The outlook is very, very good, and I've seen many patients that have gone on to live very vibrant lives after their depression is treated. I've seen people in their 80s, 90s, even people in people over 100 that have been treated for depression who have gotten better and have gone on to have high quality of life, really enjoy being around family and friends, and enjoy their remaining years. So there is much hope for, for people with depression. Life has a lot to offer. You may not think about it right at this moment, but life has its ups and downs, and there is life after depression. And I learned that myself, um, and in a very, very strong and important way. I mean, my life today is really good. Uh, I'm really happy to be alive. I'm grateful for life every day. Um, so don't give up. Don't give up on yourself. Depression affects more than 6.5 million of the 35 million Americans aged 65 years or older and is the single most significant risk factor for suicide in the elderly. There is hope. Treatment works. It's important to connect elderly Americans to services that they may need and to help them build connectedness with family, friends, and the community. In today's program, we have heard about suicide in the youth, the military, and the elderly. One of the risk factors for suicide we have heard about is depression. Not all individuals with depression are suicidal. However, 90% of those who die by suicide had a diagnosed mental illness or would have been diagnosed most commonly with depression. Other risk factors include substance abuse, family history of suicide, hopelessness, impulsiveness, or aggressive behavior, barriers to receiving needed treatment, financial, social, work, or relationship loss, physical illness, and lack of connectedness. Warning signs include talking about wanting to die, talking about hopelessness or having no purpose, acting anxious or reckless, sleeping too much or too little, withdrawing or feeling isolated, uncontrolled anger, and dramatic mood changes. I am Dr. Dave Myers. If you are concerned about somebody, ask a question, save a life. It's okay to ask the person if they have thoughts of hurting themselves. Get help for mental, physical, and substance abuse disorders. If you know of someone who may be suicidal, Restricting access to lethal methods of suicide, like firearms, is extremely important. Pay attention to the warning signs of depression. Connected us to family, to the community, and to friends saves lives. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. 
If you ever feel like you need to talk to somebody. If you're feeling suicidal. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Asking for help is a sign of strength. Please call the U.S. National Suicide Prevention Hotline. 1-800-273-TALK. Or visit your nearest emergency room. Ask a question, save a life. Ask a question, save a life. Ask a question, save a life. Program support for Ask a Question, Save a Life comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Gary Lee Smith Memorial Act. This program is made possible in part by the Kim Foundation, reminding viewers there is help, there is hope, and there is healing for lives touched by mental illness. Learn more at thekimfoundation.org. Program support comes from Bryan Mental Health Services, offering hope and treatment for patients with mental health issues and their families. More information can be found at bryanhealth.org or by calling 402-481-5991.